Okay. I'm going to go ahead and, and open it, uh, Vladimir, if yeah. you're set. Great. Okay, so welcome, welcome all to this uh, first New Perspectives webinar of 2022, being hosted by our university in Surat, India, and Sri Aurobindo Integral Life Center in Surat, as well as here in Fountain Inn, South Carolina. And I'm Rade, I'm the Executive Director in Fountain Inn, and I'm joined by Dr. Vladimir Yatsenko, our Director of Research. So today we're very excited because we begin a six to 12 month exploration on the transformation of the body, a yoga whose aim is physical salvation through freedom of the body. And the mother says, quote, there are all kinds of freedom, mental freedom, vital freedom, spiritual freedom, which are the fruits of successive masteries. But a completely new freedom has become possible with the supermental manifestation. It is the freedom of the body, unquote. And so with this freedom comes the ultimate bodily transformation, a supreme, what she calls spiritual rebirth, and a supermental body with its attributes of lightness, adaptability, ah, adaptability plasticity, and luminosity. Sorry for that. Um, in this first series of six webinars, our speakers will address what is meant by transformation of the body from a metaphysical perspective and its role and its importance in the integral yoga of Sri Aurobindo and the mother. As well, several of our new perspective speakers will examine how the physical body is viewed and what place it occupies in different religious traditions and knowledge systems in the world today and in the past but all with the purview of Integral Yoga. So this series on transformation of the body is meant to help us better understand the fundamentals of Integral Yoga and to approach the evolution of consciousness and the future material manifestations. So again, we'd like to welcome all our attendees and due to a last minute scheduling conflict, Amita Mira is not able to join us today. And so instead, Dr. Vladimir Yatsenko will address the Vedic vision of the body, which was a talk originally scheduled for next Saturday. Uh, Vladimir holds a master's degree in general and theoretical linguistics and in Sanskrit language and literature. He also holds a PhD in Indian philosophy. He is a scholar and instructor of Sanskrit and an educator and researcher in Vedic and Vedantic studies. Vladimir is the director of our new Institute for Applied Research in Integral Studies here in Fountain Inn. So before I hand it over to Vladimir, I just wanted to remind all the participants that if you have any questions throughout his talk, please post in the Q&A box. It's at the bottom of your screen rather than the chat box, and Vladimir will address them towards the end of his talk. Okay, and with that, Vladimir, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Radhem. Right, so we begin our um, uh, exploration of the transformation of the body from the Vedic vision, from the very beginning of what is known to us and how Sri Aurobindo relates it to the Vedas and Vedas to his integral yoga. And let me project my PowerPoint presentation, which may help us also to, um, to address this very complex and a very profound topic. Um, so as we know uh, from the Vedic tradition, especially from later uh, Upanishads, from Taittiriya Upanishad, uh, the whole Taittiriya is dedicated to this idea of five Purushas. Who are these five bodies? Five bodies within one body, as it were. And um, the idea comes uh, slowly through, and it's not totally obvious immediately, that all these bodies behind the physical body are nothing but um, differentiation or um, 
the direction towards individualization, absolute individualization of the being behind. So these bodies being more universal behind, becoming less and less universal, more and more individualized and differentiated until they become a physical body. And as you see in this picture, the physical body is the, the most surface body. Yeah? It is the body on the surface which is absolutely individualized. And individualization is taking place through the means and the help of time and space. It is in time and space that this unique position of the being can be addressed. And that's quite interesting that uh, nobody can occupy the same space. Yeah? So only one unique body can occupy a particular space and particular time. And by this time and space, he could differentiate himself and manifest himself in unique bodies. By the way, it was his major purpose to... Um, of this manifestation, as uh, the Vedas would say, Bahu Siam, may I become many. That was the idea of manifestation. Manifestation, interesting, yes? Like uh, manifesting in many, in multitude. So how could he who alone was bodiless, omnipresent, omniscient, omnipotent, become many. There was no other way, only he had to get his body. Body is his representative of his idea of becoming many. And also it tells us immediately that it is in the process, it's the phenomenon of evolutionary development. It cannot be immediately miraculously done. Because in time and space, to become many, he had to undergo so many changes. And these changes are behind this body, as you see, shining. He had to reduce himself to the most differentiated way of being. Um, and here we could um, uh, see how interestingly this body embodies that a hierarchy of consciousness from the most universal or transcendental to universal to individual. So, and it is mm, in the physical body on the surface, it is projected through the composition of the body. And the subtle body behind it with its chakras represents exactly these bodies of the standing behind in Taitiriya. So the chakras are nothing but the embodiment, these three higher chakras embodiment of the, of the mental consciousness in our physical being. These three chakras from the Anahata to Svadhishthana uh, on the torso level uh, embodying the vital being, that prana maya purusha, which is standing behind the physical body. And the lower chakras, starting with muladhara and below, which are not usually addressed, represent the physical being, the most differentiated part of his existence. What I wanted to say also is that in the Veda, when they speak about the body, you will be surprised that they don't speak about the body as something different from the spirit. Um, they ne call the body Atman. Atman Otman, that is a Vedic word which means the self. And the self is also the spirit. The spirit and every Atman possible. So if you look at these five Atmans of Taitiri uh, Upanishad, these are Atmans, yes? Annamayam Atma, the Atman self made out of matter. Pranamayam Atma, the uh, self made out of prana behind it, or within it, we could say, but it is actually behind it. It's gr bigger than the physical body. Behind it, there is Manomayam Atma, the self made of manas. And all of these selves, we have to understand, and they are important for us, because they are there for one reason, 
to manifest the divine. They are needed there because the physical, the surface being this one in front, is holding them all. It's like a string on which all these bodies are um, put together as pearls in the, in the necklace. So if that string, this su surface being, would not be there, these bodies are not needed. And uh, Taitiriya is describing them in a beautiful manner as uh, Purusha Vidha always speaks about all of these bodies in the form of Purusha. So there is a form, a formation of Purusha from the highest to the lowest. And on the lowest level they are all uh, manifested in our physical body. And you can see the, the whole constitution, the head represents the mental powers the with its three chakras, this torso, the vital powers, and the lower part of our being starting. Uh, the legs represent the physical being. So it's like uh, uh, it's like double dimension, uh, vertical and horizontal, in the depth and the vertical, put together into the physical body. Physical body embodies all of these levels of consciousness and manifests them in this very structure. We can see that the, the higher parts are more unifying, the middle part are diversifying, and finally the, the lower part are the most um, diversified. So how uh, it is viewed in the Veda, in the Rig Veda, in the oldest text, how it could come into this, where these five bodies are. So if you look at the Vedic vision, there is Aditi, the infinite consciousness power, the Divine Mother, who manifests the one being, that one being who wanted to be many. She um, embodies his wish, he follows his will, she is his will power. And so she manifests him first in the transcendental sense as Satchitapasananda. And you can see here already in Satchitapasananda the differentiation of the being. Sat is the being which embodies everything, Chittapas is the force power, consciousness force which is um, which is uh, differentiating the being or viewing the being in a particular way approaching it in a particular angle and ananda is that emanation of bliss from this perception of consciousness and power of the being by the way, uh, Shankaracharya and even Sri Aurobindo describe Ananda as already diversifying element of the conscious perception of the being. Yeah? When uh, the more we are conscious, the more we are blissful, as it were. The bliss is the emanation of the conscious perception of our own existence. So, um, so these are the uh, transcendental differentiation. So m one is more unifying, other is diversifying, and the other is con uh, is a result of this diversification and emanation of it. So the same um, is projected into the supramental godheads, Daksha, Amsha, and Surya. These are triple supermind, according to Sri Aurobindo, which he describes as uh, unity of Daksha, all unifying power of thought with capital T, and then Amsha as a part, part of the oneness, which is also part of the oneness, but also um, part as the belonging to something bigger. <laughs> so it is. it has its own already differentiation from the oneness and also belongs to that oneness. And Surya is finally is um, supramental manifestation. It already emanates rays. So you can see again this uh, kind of differentiation of from unity to one in many in many in one and many finally. And these three godheads 
of the supermind are projected into three godhoods or three greater realms of the overmental consciousness, where Savitar is the most unifying element, the highest supramental overmind, as Shubindu would call it. Vishnu is the godhead of the overmind, one in many and many in one, holding all in comprehensive unity. And Indra, interestingly, I'm speaking about Vedic vision, especially Rigveda, mainly Rigveda. Indra is that intuitive consciousness, the god of the uh, divine mind which acts upon our lower hemisphere, upon our uh, manas, prana and annam, which represent our heaven and earth put together. Indra comes with the lightning of, which is made Vajra, which is made of the light of the sun, of the light of the supramental consciousness and acts upon our lower being. Yeah. So what is interesting in this vision is that Varuna, who is the highest godhead of the purity and vastness of the divine existence, turns in the projection in the lower hemisphere by Diti, by the uh, twin sister of Aditi, dividing consciousness into the very matter, material manifestation. Yeah? Sat is turned into the material substance which holds everything and carries everything, which is our being actually. That very being which I was showing here, the surface consciousness, it is it. It is that string which is holding all the bodies. So, the chittapas is becoming prana. Prana is power and consciousness together. This is dual in nature. And Ananda, according to the Upanishads, especially at Aitiriya, becomes manomaya. Ananda, yes, becomes the made of manas ananda. Shubindu changes the scheme in the other approach. It's also, it's only a scheme, it's only a finger pointing to the truth, to the moon. One should not take it literally or in an absolute sense. You know, it has to orient our way of thinking. So Shubindu changes the scheme and he says that Anandamaya Purusha is manifested as psychic being and Manas is reflecting the supramental, so to say, so from the overmind to the supermind. So the scheme has to be a bit different, just adding to it some other thought. What is interesting that Shubindu's sign is also reflecting this triple Satchit Ananda projected into Anna, Prana and Manas, which are evolutionary and these are involutionary. So we can see in these three, two triangles, involution and evolution of being. And in the middle, in this middle is Avatar, the Lotus, and this four, the cube or the square represents the supramental consciousness, that which unites two triangles, holds them together. It is this realm. Mm -hmm. um, if you look uh, more precisely of what, so where are these five bodies here? And we can see them. The first body, transcendental Ananda Maya Purusha, that the, the highest, the the, the biggest body, the most universal or even transcendental. Eh? And then we have uh, Vijnana Maya Purusha, which is a supramental body. And then we have Manomaya Purusha, which is mental body. And then Pranamaya Purusha, which is pranic body. And finally, the physical body. So here they are, all these bodies in this vision. If you look at it uh, from this view of differentiation, it's quite interesting. We will start with the supermind, supramental body. And as I mentioned already, that unity, one in many, and many in one and many, these are the three levels of the supermind. The supermind is not one level, it's triple. 
and this differentiation from unity to diversity is taking place as it is taking place from Sat to Ananda, as we looked already, which is beyond it, which is determining it, determining this procedure of becoming many. May I be many, this will, this intention the consciousness force is putting into action. So the Svar, the overmental three Rochana, has the same triple level from the most unifying to the most diversifying intuitive consciousness as a lightning which is coming to us and breaking our uh, ceiling and bringing light from above and showing how things are in this world. And then we have triple three worlds, the triple mind, triple vital and triple physical. And you will see here again, the same idea is embodied. The mental world is triple from most unifying mental mind to the most diversifying physical mind over vital mind, which is diversifying one in many in many in one. We and in the Vedas, they are called Tisro Dhyavach, three heavens. We have three heavens beyond which there are three Rochans, three luminous realms, beyond which there is the triple supermind. And uh, the vital is also triple. We have mental vital, vital vital, and physical vital, which are called Trini Rajamsi in the Vedas. And uh, we have triple earth, Tisrobhumich, which is mental, physical, vital, physical, and physical, physical. And it is only on the physical, physical level that the diversification is taking its supreme, utmost possibility. All the rest is more or less has some freedom here, yeah? but physical, physical, it's the point in time and space which cannot be occupied by any other point in time and space. And that creates this infinite diversity of physical elements in the world. They are, they are all very similar because of the mental physical. The mind is unifying them in structures, in the, in the meanings, in the comprehensive relations, but in their proper embodied state, they are absolutely unique. And there is none same as that part in time and space. So there are no fingerprints similar, as I was always mentioning about fingerprints, which was a big surprise for me, that there are no same fingerprints in the world. There are no same pebbles on the shore, no same leaves on the trees. They are all, all different. And I believe if we come to the atoms and quarks, they are also all different because they occupy different time and space. They cannot be the same. There's nothing the same in this world of physical reality. But, and you can see how it is beautifully inbuilt. This scheme will tell us that the physical is nothing but a spiritual enterprise. It was his idea, his being wanted to be many, and it became infinitely many in all possible forms. So if we look at the body from this point of view, we would see something very interesting. So we could see that these chakras, which I was mentioning right now, these three times three is actually in the Vedas are mentioned as Navagava Rishis, Rishis of nine rays. Here they are, nine rays, covering from the most physical to the most mental. And these Navagava Rishis invoke Indra from the overmind. Uh, with the help of Ayas Yarishi, he brings influence of Indra. Indra is breaking the ceiling with his lightning and they become Dashagva Rishis. They join the supramental consciousness. So they overcome the limit of uh, our 
embodied state of this uh, earthly state of consciousness. This was the uh, myth of Angirasa Rishis. So Navagva Rishis, Rishis of nine rays become the Rishis of ten rays. They are not mentioned twelve rays, but there are twelve. By the way, uh, about the scheme, a few more words, these are the chakras yeah, in the body. As we know, and we will see in the next slide about these chakras, and you could see clearly that mental physical is the and the muladhara chakra, physical vital is svadhisthana, vital vital is the uh, manipura, mental vital, which is higher vital, is anahata, and the heart chakra, and then physical mind is Vishuddha, vital mind is Ajna, and mental mind is Sahasrara chakra, that is, which is connecting us to the beyond. And the beyond, there are three more chakras, which Mother mentions, and they belong to the overmental consciousness, which we usually don't reach to. Yeah? So we in the Tantra, they don't speak about them because once you reach, become the Shagvarishi, you, uh, there is totally new law of existence there beyond. And so it's irrelevant for us to speak about it. And there are two lower chakras, vital physical and physical physical on the level of the knees and feet, Mother mentions about this, which are also never mentioned because we do not have access to that consciousness. So now I want to make this um, clearer here. You could see them. So Sahasrara on the top, Ajna in the, uh, it's, uh, the chakras are the subtle body influences of those bodies of mental, vital, standing behind the physical. So we have our triple arrangement. Notice the torso is pranic part, head is the mental part and the legs are the physical proper part yeah. and there are three chakras three levels of them on each of these parts so we are triple in nature it's quite interesting so even our head if you look at our head we will see that triplicity of the mental <laughs> we'll see mental mental in the vision we will see breath nose in the diversifying element of breathing force and they finally expression the mouth the expression of the word is from the mouth which is most physical mental so in a way the our physicality took the form of those levels of consciousness standing behind it. And we can look at it also from the point of view of the major Varnas, from the Purusha Sukta of the Veda. And the Brahmana became his mouth, his mouth became Brahmana, the other way around. Uh, his torso, his, uh, so to say, his shoulders and hands, and notice uh, hands and shoulders, they do not belong to torso properly. They are in between head and torso and constitute a very strong part of a human being. Yeah, because they reach out, they can grab, they can give, they can exchange, they act upon the world. And that is Kshatriya, power. It's a fourfold division. Yeah? So in between head and torso, there is also the shoulder belt and also chest, chest with the heart. I think the heart also is important to mention to a certain extent with Kshatriyas rather than Vaishyas. And then Vaishya is a proper reproductory organs. They are mentioned as urus, as the, the thighs even, because reproduction is taking place here. Reproduction of the oneself and also the enjoyment of food. It is that exchange, enjoyment of exchange with the world. Partaking of food, enjoying it, appropriating it, making it part of ourself, and casting the seed, giving life of oneself uh, to, to the offspring. Yeah? This is the exchange, partaking and giving, partaking and giving. And finally, the legs. 
Shudra, which are supporting the whole structure, making it mobile, making it reach wherever it wants to go. So you can see these four parts, knowledge, power, enjoyment of exchange and service. These are four major powers of the mother. Yeah, Maheshwari, Mahakali, Mahalakshmi and Mahasaraswati. That's how body took it in, embodied it in, into itself. So if you look at the body from this point of view, we would see exactly these major four varnas embodied in the body. <laughs> and that's why body is actually uh, more integral. It integrates all uh, varnas. It is chatur varnia. And that's why we have to become Chaturvarnia. We have to be masters in knowledge, in power, in exchange and enjoyment and service. And there are more things which I would like to mention, but most probably if, uh, uh, because of lack of time, I would not go into all the details, but I want to tell something, some intuitive thought about it. You would see that these speech, hands, procreatory, excretory organs and legs are um, karmendrias in the, in the Sankhya philosophy. And also they are mentioned by Sri Aurobindo in The Secret of the Veda as the major powers or the major senses of action. Um, in the Vedas, they are known as Panis. These Panis, are, they evolved out of the inconscient and they want to represent in this material form frame the four powers of the spirit. This is something uh, uh, important to understand and they do not have the capacity really, but um, because they evolved out of the inconscient. But what they can do, they can recognize and grab the light. So they grab all the light which comes to them and they store it in the subconscious cave, as it were, where they evolved. It is their home, as it were. And from that home, they trade these uh, valuable lights or treasures and by that they evolve and develop themselves as technologies within the bodily framework. So to say, um, they are robbers and traffickers and traders known in, in, uh, in the Veda. And uh, in one of the hymns, Rishi, uh, by invoking dawn, he says, come dawn to us, but may the Panis sleep because they will, when they wake up, they steal your light and take it away. And that is the reason why our illuminations and our meditations do not have that lasting effect. Because all the, what we acquire as the higher perception of ourselves is taken away from us, snatched away by these very um, injuries of action. Uh, and that's quite interesting. Whenever they are activated, we become less perceptive of our inner being. Whenever they are pacified, sleep as it were, we may have a chance to to perceive deeper of our inner being. So that's how the whole method of yogas were developed, that we have to become immobile. We have to sit still and quiet. We have to stop thinking, thinking even, because thought is the word, the constant wording of things. We have to stop breathing the, the breath is becoming very shallow when we meditate. And then we have a chance to go deeper and to perceive our inner being. The moment we become active with our hands, legs, words, thoughts, we are losing that connection. That was the question which, uh, uh, which Pavitra uh, 
put to Sri Aurobindo, he said, whenever I am in meditation, everything goes well. I can feel the presence, the pressure, the descent of power. But the moment I try to think and to solve some equation, because he was a mathematician, my mind rushes and I disconnect from that light. I don't have the, the same connection. And he asks him, what should I do to keep the inner perception and the outer action intact? And Sri Aurobindo says, you have to go slow. You have to keep the inner perception and go nearly mechanical with the outer being, teaching it by practicing to keep the inner perception, teaching it to keep that inner light while doing things. And this is the major issue of our psychology and of our body. Uh, and I wanted to, at the end of my presentation, before we go to the questions and answers, to show you something more. The divine plan. <laughs> Here is our body. It's important for us to see the, how these all these levels are connected to the divine body. What is this divine plan? This is our surface consciousness embodied, uh, totally differentiated state of being of the Supreme, and which is connecting to our intuition, to our higher levels. They are all represented here on all the levels. They are... I will not go through all of them, just showing you the, and how we are connecting it to the most inconscient and nascent levels of the being. And we do not have, here, there is disconnect with the supermind. And we need to connect to that level and to go beyond even. That connection is to be established within this body. This body is not capable of doing that connection yet because it grew up from this obscure mind, from this inconscient. And because it grew up from that evolutionary past, it inherited that animal body. And that animal body is not capable of connecting to the highest levels of consciousness. So, but there is something here which is present within the psychic being, uh, which in the Veda they call Dvipad, the, our unborn and inborn self is present, which are determining and calling for more and more evolution in the body, that it becomes more and more capable of connecting higher and higher levels. And this is the evolutionary view. We are very privileged as human beings to have, to be dvipad, to have these two, unborn self, jivatma, and inborn self, antaratma because they are connected. We have the awareness of the divine before the body was formed. And we have the embodied self within the body which is determining and leading this evolution of the body towards the divine manifestation. There is a beautiful work written by Sri Aurobindo which is called The Divine Body. He wrote it at the end of his life, in 1949 already. And uh, uh, 1949 in August, for Bulletin. Yeah? And he starts it with this question, or with this proposition. A divine life in a divine body is a formula of the ideal that we envisage. Actually, this is the whole purpose, the whole vision of his life. But what will be the divine body? What will be the nature of this body? Its structure, the principle of its activity, the perfection that distinguishes it from the limited and imperfect physicality within 
which we are now bound? What will be the conditions and operations of its life? still physical in its base upon the earth, by which it can be known as divine. Still physical, that's important. And then he gives very interesting visions, which we already discussed in the, in the uh, vision of the Vedic uh, paradigm. The centers of the subtle body, sukshma sharira, of which one could, one would become conscious and aware of all going on in it, would pour their energies into material nerve and plexus and tissue and radiate them through the whole material body all the physical life and its necessary activities in this new existence could be maintained and operated by these higher agencies in a freer and ampler way and by a less burdensome and restricting method this might go so far that these organs might cease to be indispensable and even be felt as too obstructive. The central force must use them less and less and finally throw aside their use altogether. If that happened, they might waste by atrophy, be reduced to an insignificant minimum or even disappear. The central force might, must, sorry, might sublimate, oh, sorry, might substitute for them subtle organs of a very different character. So instead of gross organs, subtle organs. Or, if anything material was needed, instruments that would be forms of dynamism or plastic trans transmitters rather than what we know as organs. So they become a transmitters of some higher spiritual force. And now he goes into details. The brain would be a channel of communication of the form of the thought, a channel of communication of the form of the thought, and a battery of their insistence on the body and the outside world, where they could then become effective directly, the thoughts communicating themselves without physical means, from mind to mind, producing with a similar directness effects on the thoughts, actions and lives of others, or even upon material things. So brain becomes the agent, the battery, for these activities of the mind upon the outer world. The heart would equally be direct communicant and medium of interchange for the feelings and emotions thrown outward upon the world by the forces of the psychic center. It will be captured, captivated by psychic center. Heart could reply directly to heart. The life force come to the help of other lives and answer their call in spite of strangeness, strangers, strangeness and distance. Many beings without any external communications thrill with the message and meet in the secret light from one divine center. So this is the communication and feeling the whole world, all the beings within oneself. This is the heart, and there are more things. The will might control the organs that deal with food, safeguard automatically the health, eliminate greed and desire, 
substitute subtler processes or draw in strength and substance from the universal life force so that the body could maintain for a long time its own strength and substance without loss or waste. Remaining thus with no need of sustenance by material elements and yet continue a strenuous action with no fatigue or pause for sleep or repose. The soul's will of the, or the mind's will could act from higher sources upon the sex center and the sex organs so as to check firmly or even banish the grosser sexual impulse or stimulus and instead of serving an animal excitation or crude drive or desire, turn their use to the storing, production and direction towards brain and heart and life force of the essential energy orders, of which this region is the factory so as to support the works of the mind and soul and spirit and higher life powers and limit the expenditure of the energy on lower things. The soul, the psychic being, could more easily fill all with the light and turn the very matter of the body to higher uses of its own greater purpose. The new type, the divine body, must continue the already developed evolutionary form. There must be a, a continuation from the type nature has all along been developing and continuity from the human to the divine body. No breaking away to something unrecognizable. This is an important why Sri Aurobindo actually refused to accept, you remember when mother brought to him the mantra of life and death, and he refused to use it. This is the reason, because the evolution, we have to support the evolution, what nature is doing. But a high sequel to what has already been achieved and in part perfected. It is perfected only in part. The human body has in its parts and instruments that have been sufficiently evolved to serve the divine life. These have to survive in their form, though they must be still further perfected, their limitations of range and use removed, their liability to defect and malady and impairment eliminated, their capacities of cognition and dynamic action carried beyond the present limits. New powers have to be acquired by the body which our present humanity could not hope to realize, could not even dream of, or could only imagine. Much that can now only be known, worked out or created by the use of invented tools and machinery might be achieved by the new body in its own power or by the inhabitant spirit through its own direct spiritual force. The body itself might acquire new means and ranges of communication with other bodies, new processes of acquiring knowledge, new aesthetics, new potencies of manipulation of itself and objects. And I'm finishing with the final. It might not be impossible for it to possess or to disclose means native to its own constitution substance of natural instrumentation for making the far near and annulling distance. Can you imagine that? 
cognizing what is now beyond the body's cognizance, acting where action is now out of its reach or its domain, developing subtleties and plasticities which could not be permitted under present conditions to the needed fixity of a material frame in this animal body. These and other numerous potentialities might appear and the body become an instrument immeasurably superior to what we can now imagine as possible. So that's why he says that we are the transitional being. This body is a, a constant becoming of a, the divine. There could be an evolution from a first apprehending truth, consciousness, to the utmost heights of the ascending ranges of supermind, and it may pass the borders of the supermind proper itself, where it begins to shadow out, develop, delineate expressive forms of life touched by a supreme pure existence, consciousness and bliss, which constitute the worlds of a highest truth of existence, dynamism of tapas, glory and sweetness of bliss, the absolute essence and pitch of the all-creating ananda. The transformation of the physical being might follow this incessant line, line of progression and the divine body reflect or reproduce here in a divine life on the earth something of this highest greatness and glory of the self-manifesting spirit. I wanted to read these longish passages. These are the nearly last writings of Sri Aurobindo. They are giving us a sense of everything what we are looking for and why we are here. And now I stop and open to the whatever discussions, questions, answers, whatever is possible to discuss. And maybe you can start uh, stop screen sharing. There we go. Perfect. I, I do before you, I know there's a couple of questions there, but I do have a, a, a question. Um, and, and perhaps I missed this. I had uh, several people trying to get in uh, to the uh, webinar. But um, so the Rig Veda, my question is this. Um, did the Rishis place a, an importance on the transformation of the body that we see in Chubindo and the mother's uh, works. And um, if so, if you could explain a little bit, you know, what comes to mind, Vladimir, is the Ashwins and their medical feats, right? That they were uh, allowing the blind to see, the deaf to hear, replacing, you know, horse's head on the body. So what came to mind as we were speaking is perhaps, perhaps these were two of the divine energies that in some way was preparing the body to receive the supermental light and and i as i recall they are actually the grandchildren of surya of the sun which represents the supermental so i'm wondering if you can just do kind of a a comparison where we might find this in the rig veda this importance of transformation of the body right uh, actually the whole rig veda is about this constant transformation and immortality concept which we they speak always the amritam that uh, which has to be achieved is all about their and uh, their constant transforming. Ashwins are representatives of the healing power, later especially known as the healers, um, but they are actually the the supramental forces, you rightly said, they are the, they belong to the uh, sun god, uh, they are the children of uh, Vivasvat or Surya uh, in the form of Vivasvat, and um, they are um, kind of 
involved supramental light, which is so acting on the level of the vital Ashwins. Yes, they are those riders over Ashva. Ashva is the force, vital force of breath. And these are all symbols of the Vedic language. And uh, they are two of them, as we know, two Ashwins. That's interesting. Yes, and these are also the symbolically Nakula and Sahadeva in the Mahabharata when they are born. Ashwins are born in the form of Nakula and Sahadeva. One is belonging more to the power, other is to consciousness or to the light of consciousness. So light of consciousness and power is in our scheme we were showing that prana embodies uh, chit shakti and it's exactly that power which um, which manifests the, the divine being or the body and it is because of this power that it can cure the divine body, the body and because of this divine power. So the, the body, the physical body is mainly cured and repaired by the vital force. It's the incapacity of the body to receive that vital impulse and to be open enough, to have enough resources to perceive it, to allow it, to kind of to take it in, that we are becoming old and sick and die. If we would have an access to the reservoir of this absolute power of the vital, and especially illumined by the supramental light, not to the vital powers of different kind, yeah, which are different creatures try to possess our body to enjoy themselves, to amuse themselves in this manifestation, but really properly to the supramental within the vital, then that would be the, I think, the ideal for immortality of the body. But the body is not yet capable of holding to that force. Even our vital force is not capable to hold to the supramental force. And our mental is not capable of holding to any of these higher forces, not to say to the supramental. We are not able even to hold the overmental or the higher mind uh, consciousness. Mother worked on her body and you know the whole work of uh, what she did in the agenda, it was about this transformation of the body. And, uh, and according to her, she uh, f formed, created an immortal, mental and vital bodies of herself, which is which is difficult to imagine because they have to be immortalized. They have to become totally conscious and f finally formed before the physical can become uh, totally open and modulated to be open to the higher consciousness. Yeah. So, well, there is much to say here, yes which is going beyond this. But Rig Veda, yes. And what is interesting that uh, I didn't mention other words which are used in the Rig Veda for the body, like poor, the, the fortress, yeah, um, or shariram, well-known word. Shariram is the, or deha, deha is the house. Sharira is the protection. Actually, the body, is our protection against these forces which try to enter and to possess us, possess our embodiment. Yeah? There are many forces in the world which would love to possess this body. Uh, and because it represents the divine manifestation and they can endure, ag ag aggrandize themselves and make themselves stronger through this body. Uh, Right. Something I lost my track of thought. I wanted to say something. You also have several questions there. And I, I was ca yeah, carried away. All right. There are several questions. Uh, the bodily dysfunction, like spinal problems, pain in legs <laughs> and feet, obesity also, represents the imbalance in the body. What does these Vedas say about it? 
If, is there a way to bring the harmony into this disharmony? It's a very good way of putting it, disharmony. Actually, the, the major problem of the body is that disharmony yes, between different parts. And Mother says that it is even the, the cause for a, any dysfunction or disease, that some organs take over charge over some functionality in, in the fields where they should not. So there is a certain disbalance between different parts of the being, which, which is manifested as a disease. If there would be total harmony in the parts of the being, uh, then body would be totally functional and there will be never disease. Most probably it would be immortal even. But because we are evolving, because it's not the final product, uh, the disequilibrium is uh, important. Yeah? And uh, it is pushing us, it is constantly pushing us towards new uh, capacity of consciousness. It is not the final capacity of these organs. It's not the final uh, outcome in the physical sense. So it has to change, it has to evolve. And Sri Aurobindo says it has to become transmitted and then maybe even should be omitted altogether once the, the action of the spirit can go through the body straight into the manifestation. So they become basically the, uh, the mediators between the spirit and this outer world the organs the, of the body. And if they are harmonized totally with the spirit, which is the question of the evolution, which we do not have today, that's why we struggle, all of us struggle, because we are packed in this animal body which we inherited from the past and we are aspiring towards a higher consciousness. So this is the problem of our existence. So all the dysfunctions will be coming and all the diseases and death is still inevitable because this is not the final product of evolution. Fascinating. Where, which book can we refer to, to this piece of writing by Sri Aurobindo? Um, this, uh, this passage which I read was from the bulletin uh, which was published in 1949 in August. It's actually one and a half year before he passed, before he left his body. So this is one of the latest writings of Sri Aurobindo. Did you have this in a PDF that uh, I have it in, to folks? Yes, I can send in the PDF if somebody is interested. Yeah, I think we all would be. Hmm. Where can I find the text? Uh, I guess it's answered already. Rashi, yes. Since we are in so many bodies at the same time, how does one in daily life kind of practically identify which body are we in? We are in, in all the bodies simultaneously, yes. But sometimes we shift, yes, you are right. Say manomaya, pranamaya, how to become more and more aware of this? Because awareness is the first step, right? Right, absolutely. Uh, I agree, and that is something we have to practice in and uh, study Sri Aurobindo and the Mother and the scriptures and practice yoga and become aware of uh, where we are talking from, where we are looking at things from, from the higher, from the lower, from the emotional being, from the mental being, from the intellectual being, from the higher mind uh, overview, from the illumined mind, intuition. And so these are all elements of our mm, consciousness which we have to examine and we study them by living and practicing. All life is yoga, Sri says, because life is this practice of consciousness and building up suitable body for the divine manifestation. Good. 
Okay. Um, any other any other questions or, or comments from uh, the group? We are just a little bit over, and um, I thought Vladimir, it would be uh, nice if you could maybe say a few words about the two courses that uh, just started, but not too late to to join. We still have a few people that are registering, but if you could maybe just uh, explain a little bit about the Sanskrit and the uh, Vedic course for our group and uh, and I can put how to uh, register in the uh, in the chat box right if uh, in case somebody is interested to join our uh, two newly designed courses uh, for the introduction to the Vedic Sanskrit, especially language of the Rishis, how they used uh, the mantras and the hymns to elevate and uplift the consciousness, um, the means of uh, how they uh, use the etymological, transparent etymology of Sanskrit and uh, charged it with, uh, with the psychological uh, and spiritual uh, meaning. Uh, and uh, the second course is about the Vedas, introduction to the Vedic vision, the foundations of Indian culture. The first part would be about the Vedas. And there we would deal with um, the whole uh, Shruti and Smriti uh, literature, all the elements of this literature, what they are about, their content, uh, their purpose their relations with the rituals uh, and uh, so on and so forth about the rishis their families uh, their deities godhoods relations between them so if somebody is interested you are most welcome and um, also i'm just going to put this last one we'll call it foundations of indian culture so i've put the sanskrit mm -hmm. uh, and i'm going to put uh, the other place where you can learn more and you can also register. Um, so it did start last week. Uh, these courses, they have been, uh, both sessions have been recorded. So if you want to sign up, Vladimir uh, will send you last week's so that you're caught up and you can join us uh, this week. Um, for those out there also, we have tomorrow uh, coming up a new series of workshops that's on uh, the four powers and, and 12 qualities of the mother. And I'm just kind of getting that URL too. Um, all of it should have been in our, our last newsletter that has gone out, but it's breaking through and it's uh, spiritual progress and the role of power and uh, courage. So this is four weeks. We have Rashi on with us. He, uh, she is one of our instructors, uh, first time with uh, this series, as well as Vladimir, myself, and we have uh, Shridalu opening tomorrow. So let me also just put uh, that URL there, um, which you can read a little bit more about and, and hopefully join us tomorrow morning. Uh, let's see, it looks like you've got one more question. Yes, there is one more. It's coming. Um, given we are in all the bodies, is there a, f is there a focus on a particular body? to prevent the panis stealing. <laughs> okay, interesting practical question. Yeah. Um, uh, it's, um, yeah, so the whole method of uh, yoga was developed not to wake up the panis, yes? So we have to become still and passive and relaxed. And uh, this peace, peace is the the means to to keep up panis in in the uh, uh, kind of away from the inner light. But there is another method which Mother and Shirobindo mention and introduce, and that is karma yoga. Karma yoga is an interesting and a kind of ancient form of the sacrifice where the panis these very um, indrias of action are engaged in such a way um, that they would not obstruct the light yeah? so mother says take any activity and do it as yoga so this is the way a kind of indication of so we should not do activity just for the sake of activity. We do activity as the means of acquiring this higher knowledge. 
So all the activities have to become educational in a way. And that's why Auroville was created, that all the activities in the city would be, have that spiritual significance. So we don't do things for the sake of doing them or achieving something by doing them. We are doing it for consciousness, first of all, to achieve higher consciousness, higher awareness through activities. And this was introduced by Sri Aurobindo in the Mother very strongly and by the Gita. Gita is, of course, speaks about Karma Yoga and Krishna says many things and he says that this was the ancient yoga which was lost once over a period of long time, the ancient yoga of how to keep an embodied spirit in this embodiment and that is Karma Yoga. So there is no way that we um, could avoid Panis and Shirobindo says although Panis are treated in the Veda as enemies, um, they similar to Dasyus, Danavas, all those Vrikas, uh, Rakshasas, Paishachas, Shushnas, there are many enemies, uh, anti-divine forces, but uh, uh, they are not enemies, he says. They are just not capable and not aware of senses of action. And we have to become, to make them aware by our practice. And more we make them aware, more they become friendly with the spirit, the more we can evolve in this body. Good. Well, thank you so much, Vladimir, and we thank everybody for joining us today. So what uh, we will do is in the next uh, 24 or 48 hours, we'll send out to everybody that registered for this course and uh, attended a link um, to where you can find this recording on our website. We'll send out PDF of the Divine Body and also PDF of uh, Vladimir's slides. So um, hope you enjoyed. And again, uh, thank you so much uh, for joining us today. Thank you. Namaste. Namaste.